Welcome back from lunch. Um, I'm happy to introduce or to show what I've done with Docker uh, on my HPC, little HPC environment. Uh, there's no demo though, it's in the, in the abstract, but I skipped this part and wanted to raise some question at the end. So the talk should be like 30 minutes and then I hope to have like 10 minutes for, um, for questions, because I think there will be some questions. So first, um, I'm not in the HPC business anymore. Um, I used to work for Bull, I used to work in the automotive industry, uh, but now I work for Gaikai. Who knows Gaikai? Without looking at the picture? <laughs> ah, still. <laughs> okay, so Gaikai is a, the division, subdivision of Sony who's behind PlayStation now, which is a video game streaming um, um, part of, of Sony. It's basically like YouTube or Netflix without caching and with controller feedback. So we cannot buffer one hour of gameplay. We have to do it all live. So that's kind of a nice environment for an HPC guy, even. Um, but that's just um, some little stuff. Now I want to go into the bits and pieces where, which comprises my, my stack that I present today. First, a little introduction to Linux containers. Burak was so kind to give uh, one slide about it, and I would like to uh, elaborate on it a little bit more. So in traditional, so I, here now we have side by side traditional virtualization and containerization. Um, with tradi traditional virtualization, we have a hypervisor, and on this hypervisor we emulate a complete virtual machine. Hence the name virtual machine, right? And um, within this virtual machine, we spin up our own kernel, we spin up the user land, and we spin up all the services with an init system that is uh, part of the operating system running in this kernel, uh, in this uh, virtual machine. With containers, it's a little bit different. Containers um, do not spin up the distinct kernel for each, so to speak, virtual machine or guest. Um, they use the host kernels, uh, the host kernel, and they just spin up a distinct user land. And the user land are independent from each other, so it could be that the uh, host kernels, uh, host user land is tiny core Linux as it is with boot to Docker, and all the different containers they run their own. Uh, user lands like Ubuntu, Red Hat, CoreOS, Alpine Linux, what have you. And the separation between the different um, between the different containers is done by kernel namespaces. So kernel namespaces, what is kernel namespaces all about? Um, containers are basically just group processes and they are isolated by kernel namespaces. And kernel namespaces are around for, for a lot of a long time, a couple of years, 2.6, I think were the first introduced. And one of the easiest to understand and one of the easiest to show is the PIT namespace. So each container has its own um, PIT table. So the first process you start with in a container gets the, the PIT zero um, as of the context of the container. In the host system, the, service, uh, the process is also present, but with a completely different uh, PIT because uh, the host has a different namespace, right? And there are other namespaces, I don't want to touch them in detail, but um, there is a network namespace which gives you your unique um, IP connectivity with your own uh, internet, uh, Ethernet devices. There is a mount namespace which provides separation of mount points. There is an IPC namespace which provides inter-process communication isolation and uh, there's one namespace called UTS which gives you your own host name and your own domain. And each container, and this is an ex as an example on the container four on the right hand side, each container has its own namespace of all of this kind, right? But it's possible to merge different namespaces. So for instance, I could spin up container one with its own namespace and then tell container two to use the same namespace network-wise as the first container. So they can communicate via localhost and um, appear to be the same, the same guest. And this could be done for most of the namespaces. PIT, uh, not, but this hopefully comes in the next releases. Okay, and the resources are constrained or restricted by C groups. I haven't made a slide of it, but uh, you could basically say container is only able to write this and that amount of uh, megabytes per second to the file system or use only five megabytes per second on the, on the network interface or has only a couple of shares in the CPU scheduling, that's, um, yeah, that's that. 
Yeah, and since it's only one kernel, this is I, I should have talked about it on the previous slide. But since uh, the the container or all the containers in the host system share the same kernel, the resource allocation and the scheduling is only done by this one kernel, right? If you have a virtual machine or a physical machine with two sockets and each socket has 16 cores, and you give this all this all the cores to the same virtual machine, the virtual machine will see it as one big CPU with uh, 32 cores. And with containers, that's not the case anymore because there's only one kernel in charge, and this is kind of nice as well. And you can pin the CPUs that that's a given. So you could tell a container he's only able to run on core zero or con core zero and or core two and so on. So that's pretty um, a lot of knobs and a lot of stuff you can um, provide or you can change. So the first real uh, part is the Docker engine. Docker engine is formally known as a Docker runtime. They call it now Docker engine. Or from uh, version 1.9 on. Um, it's basically the daemon that creates, removes, alters, and manipulates start stops and so on, the containers that are started on the system. And it does this by exposing a RESTful API, which um, is by default a Unix socket, but could also be a TCP socket, so you can do it over the network. And it handles the namespaces, as I show, show, have shown on the previous slide, the C groups, and bind mounts and so on. And the IP connectivity, which I would like to show here as an example, is done by default. Again, uh, via uh, Linux network bridge called Docker Zero. And each container connects to this uh, bridge by default and gets an IP address from this bridge. And this normal default IP address would be uh, 1, 2, 7, 16, and then uh, 0, 0, so a 16 subnet. And you can expose ports for. Uh, from each container, it's basically like uh, forwarded ports in virtual machines. So you could tell container one, your port 80 within the container is exposed as port 8080 on the external interface. But that's all Linux networking. So if you're familiar with it, you can tweak it and um, you could even start a container without any networking and then detach networks after the fact. Or that's, that's pretty scriptable and pretty uh, easy to handle if you know Linux networking. Um, second layer uh, is Docker Compose. So if you want to start multiple containers as a stack, then you can either do it by creating a little bash script with mul multiple lines of the docker run command. So this is a docker run command. Um, I gave him a host name, I gave it um, the container name, the DNS is defi defined, the port that which should be exposed defined and so on, and some environment variables. But this is pretty I wouldn't say ugly, but uh, cumbersome to, to maintain, right? A bash script with all these lines. So what um, Docker came up with or bought uh, was Docker Compose, formerly known as Docker Fic. Well, not Docker Fic, but Fic. And this provides a YAML file which um, yeah, provides information about all the runtime um, configuration options that should be given to the different containers. So in this, I, I had this one console container with all the options, and then the, on the bottom we see another container, and so on. It, it could go for, yeah, for, for not forever, but there could be a lot of containers started with only one Docker Compose file. And that's pretty neat and pretty easy to do. So best practice is if you have a Docker, a Docker container that you want to build, you put a Docker Compose file next to it to give uh, a guidance on how to use it. That's how I do it, and I think that's a very good practice to do. So up next is Docker networking. So prior to uh, Docker 1.9, you only had this Docker bridge that I showed on the previous slide, which is only local. So if you have two servers and you want to connect two different uh, containers, then you had to do a couple of tricks to provide connectivity between the nodes. And with Docker 1.9, they introduced Docker networking, which spans across multiple physical hosts. So here I have like three or yeah, three boxes for multiple hosts. Um, there is a key value store involved so that all the Docker engines can connect to a key value store and uh, share the information about which containers are in which network parts. And so first you have to stamp up either Zookeeper, etcd, or uh, Consul. I choose Consul because I use it for a couple of months or years now. Uh, so it's my favorite, but could be any other key value store on the list. And the Docker engines, as said, connect to this key value store and synchronize uh, across each other. And then one can span a global network, so you can have multiple networks, just um, 
create this network and then connect the containers you want to connect to it uh, to this one network or you could even connect it to multiple networks. So if you have like one global, one internal, one zookeeper or what have you, you could connect different containers to different sets of uh, networks and so create a very nice development environment for or even a production environment. Oh, I'm not sure about production environment yet but for development for sure it's very um, easy and pretty nice to use. So now the containers are running on different physical machines but they seem to be in the same or they are in the same subnet and it seems uh, it's transparent to the user whether it's on server 0, 1 or n or whatever. So that's kind of nice. Next is Docker Swarm. So if you have multiple machines it's doable but cumbersome to create machines or containers on the different nodes or on the different uh, machines because you have to connect to the TCP port of the different Docker engines and then you can start the container. So if I want to start a container on server 1 then I have to connect to his IP address or host name and um, with this 2376 port if I want to start a container on server 0 I have to connect with my Docker client to this <coughs> Docker engine and it's a little bit cumbersome as everyone can imagine, right? So what uh, Docker came up with is Swarm which uh, creates a cluster of Docker engines which are front-ended or proxied by a Swarm master. So this Swarm master connects to all the Swarm clients and provides an additional port with which you can start and stop containers. And if you do not do anything and you say, okay, Docker run a command, uh, Docker run a container, then it will uh, decide uh, on which node it's residing. But you could also filter and tell Docker Swarm to um, constrain or uh, yeah, you can, you can change or you can alter the, the placement by different environment variables that you can set. So you could constrain it to a certain node or you could tell him, okay, uh, this is my SQL, I want to be next to a, to a, um, yeah, a, a web server or you could tell him, I don't want to be next to something else, so I don't want to be next to myself, for instance. So if you have a, a Redis cluster, you want to spread one container and only one on each machine, then you just say, okay, affinity uh, is not, I won't be, ne not, uh, I won't be next to uh, a container of the same kind. So that's also pretty nice. So this is Swarm. Um, just one screenshot how the Docker info command looks on a Docker engine, so this is a Docker engine information, and if I put it or point it to the Docker Swarm uh, master, then uh, we see all the aggregated information. I, I skipped a couple of lines, but basically it's uh, aggregated information about above the complete cluster. And Swarm will also, in the newest version, reschedule hosts or containers that are gone down because the physical machine, for instance, goes down. So this is a very nice tool, and it's very Unix-like in, in that it's, it's to the point, in my opinion, so it's, it solves the problem of uh, a cluster of multiple Docker engines, and that's it, so it's not, not too fancy, not too much. Okay, that said, um, I like to play around with, with Docker since like two years now, I think, and nowadays if I learn about new technologies like this network, Python uh, notebook, uh, I usually I, I started to create my own container with it, uh, which is kind of nice and I have a good feeling about spreading uh, unicorns and rainbows but for people that are not me and which are in charge of the infrastructure I use they might have a different perception and I think um, some of you might have this perception as well he has all these new cool technologies but I don't like it so I, I have to be aware that this is the case and I try to, um, to, not, to not interfere too much or to not throw over too much. Oh, the problem with Docker or Linux containers in general is that everyone has an opinion about Docker nowadays or Linux containers and it's on everyone's PR chart to be containerized or to be Docker ready or to be clustered or what have you. So for instance Chef, Puppet, Ansible, they have different modules and components to, to run containers or to start containers or to install Docker, the Docker engine mm -hmm. and uh, it's not helping um, yeah, in, in getting the point across, but that's, I think it's natural because Docker or Linux containers, they spend a lot of ground, right? So 
They are from the developer's laptop to big installations and to different parts and components of each of these stacks. They change a lot of things or they might change a lot of things. So it's natural that there is a lot of bus and a lot of bus words around um, in this space. So some misconception I, I got last year, I think, this year is a little bit better. If you talk about Linux containers, everyone says, ah, okay, it's like virtual machines. I know virtual machines, it's, it's okay. But the pro problem is that virtual machines, or that's my, my idea or my view on it, is virtual machines, they didn't change the way the paper tray works, right? So it was easy to shoehorn virtual machines into our physical formats and our physical or, or processes for physical machines. So an IP address, I know, I'm not sure, I mean, show of hands, who has the same process to get an IP address for a virtual machine than for a physical machine? None? One, two, yeah, so, I mean, that's, and this will break with Linux containers, <coughs> because uh, Linux containers, as I said, they have different pro namespaces, you can merge main namespaces, so how do you deal with container that uses the namespace, uh, the network namespace of another container. It's it the same paper trail? No, I don't think so. So this will change or might change a lot. And as I said, it spans a lot of ground. So from the laptop of a developer um, to dev cluster staging production or, or big HPC jobs, there, there is a lot of ground that is spent, uh, that it's, it's covered by Linux containers or could be covered by Linux containers. And this is also a problem. If you talk to someone who, who wants to talk about the laptop of a developer and you start bragging about Docker Swarm, then yeah, there's a lot of misconception in this. And Docker Inc. Uh, focuses or has focused uh, a lot of this do Docker, uh, this developer's laptop. So for instance, they, they drop the IP tables in one version without telling anyone. So if you install Docker Engine or Docker Runtime in that, that um, day, then it drops the IP tables and open it up for everyone. So this is also not helping when you talk to system operations guys and say, oh yeah, install it, no problem. And then afterwards, ah, you know, IP tables are dropped and I'm open to the world. Not helping. And as I said, namespace is a new concept, or it's not new, it was around in uh, OpenVZ or, or jails or zones, so it's not really new, but uh, as Burak said, Docker, they popularized, popularized um, Linux containers and made it easy to use it, so it's getting more and more momentum, and the namespaces are something different. So we have to think of how we can leverage it, how we can use it, and so on. So what I want to do, or what I did, is um, I wanted not to use special distributions like CoreOS or Atomic, not because I dislike the companies, but because I thought it's too much burden to convince people to use complete uh, different workflows and complete different um, set of tools. So uh, I think it's not really the best case if you have a data center with a lot of legacy. If you start a company and you want to use AWS or you have uh, a greenfield deployment in your own just built data center, then it might be a good idea. But for me, it's, it's too agile and too focused on, on elasticity which is not the case in, the last, uh, in, in data centers, HPC data centers, right? You do not ship in a rack of new servers every day and then the other day you ship in a, another one out, so that's, I think it's not the case. Um, yeah, as said, I would like to leverage uh, existing processes and resources, so the installation workflow and the syslog monitoring stuff and all the security uh, infrastructure, because I'm not a security guy, I hope to reuse all the stuff that's already there. Um, yeah, this was the second goal. And another goal was keep up with the Docker ecosystem. If you look at Atomic Host, it still has, or two weeks ago, it still was on Docker 1.8. So you do not have Docker networking, you do not have Docker volumes. And with the newest version 1.10, we got the first uh, view on user namespaces um, and, and other features, so you could pin an IP address. And this is not available in the earlier versions. So I want to keep up with the newest Engine, Swarm, and Compose versions to be able to leverage all these cool features. So I reduced it to the max. I put a Docker on an existing system, which I will show on the next slide. I used uh, Ansible to configure it, and it was kickstarted by Buck there. Um, I want, don't want to focus on corner cases, so I postponed the special purpose container 
like a multi-tenant IP uh, IB uh, interface, which is doable via IB or oh, SI ROV. But um, I, I postponed this because because it's in the conclusion se section. Um, and I had the HPC environment assumptions was like single tenant and I wanted to focus on performance and ease of use instead of the corner cases. So the setup. The setup was a fairly old eight node cluster courtesy to um, the HPC advisory council with uh, dual socket Xeons and 32 gigabytes of RAM and uh, Mellanox Connect X2. So I couldn't use the feature as IOV, but I want to don't want to focus on it anyway. Um, it was installed with CentOS 7.2, uh, updated from uh, early versions of uh, CentOS, and I used, as I said, Ansible to install Consul, Sensu, and Docker Engine, Docker Compose, Docker Swarm. After I after this uh, Ansible run, if it goes through, then I have this complete stack that I showed before. So the stack. Uh, let's walk through the stack. We have uh, the Docker Engine running on on eight nodes. Um, backed by the console key value store to synchronize the Docker networking part. On top of that, I uh, use Docker Swarm, which is uh, spun up by creating a Docker Swarm um, container on each of the nodes and one master to um, proxy the different engines. And they are also backed by a console. And on top of that, or within Docker Swarm, not on top, I created a Slurm cluster. So just one couple of containers with Slurm D and SSHD and uh, MunchD and a Slurm control daemon on one of the nodes. So that's the hello world of Slurm. I mean, everyone knows Slurm, right? So you have like uh, eight nodes in the first partition all, and then I have some stupid partitions, odd and even, with only the odd and only the even nodes. And if I do S run uh, with eight hosts with the host name, then I got this output. So, but this is kind of boring, just SlurmD on itself uh, is not, does not do much. So I installed a couple of applications in this container. So I have an HPCG container um, and I have another one. So I pre-staged the container. So that's, um, yeah, I have like HPCG and the next slide I will show that I have open form as well. So I have this both containers running on the node while the other is computing, which is questionable uh, due to the performance hit, but I think that the Slurm daemon on itself, that just running in each node or each container is not really doing any, any harm. So I pre-staged it. It could be done slightly different, but um, yeah, that's for another session, I think. So um, I presented uh, an MPI benchmark container. Uh, I was it, I think, in November 2014 in China on the HPC Advisory Council, and uh, Rich was also screencasting it afterwards. Uh, I have a quick link to the YouTube video of the talk and a little yeah, paper is too much. It's a structured documentation. It's not peer reviewed, so it's just structured documentation, but you can have a look at it as well. And as I said, oh, I have this open form container as well. And in March last year in Lugano, I presented uh, a session about immutable containers. So I spun up this open form containers on different uh, host systems with kernel 2.6 something and up to 4.1.18, I think. And it showed that the output of the open form run was similar across all these different kernels, which gives you a sense of how stable and mature the kernel syscalls actually are, because the only thing that the Docker container or the Linux container is talking to is to the coast systems kernel via syscall. So if this interface is stable, then you do not care about the user land of the distribution you're running. And uh, I also have like a little structured documentation and a video of the talk, which was recorded again by Rick or Rich. So, um, and since we are also talking about big data, I put a distributed SAMSA um, yeah, stack in, in this swarm cluster. So who knows SAMSA? No one. That's cool. Or that's yeah. That's maybe not cool, but Samsa is pretty. Uh, it's pretty nice uh, fit. It's a it's Kafka backed um, distributed processing or streaming no, pro streaming processor. So uh, you have, for instance, you could have your logs running into Kafka, which is a distributed event log, and then you have different Samsa instances doing stuff with this uh, log file. So you could 
gather information on how often an event occurs and then try to predict when an ev another event occurs. So you read from Kafka, you write to Kafka, and um, that makes it very um, scalable because a scalable cluster, a Kafka cluster can handle a lot of events um, at the same time if you scale it up by using a lot of nodes. And uh, for the, the best guys uh, in the audience, this is basically what SAMSA does. You have like the pipes are the, the Kafka um, cluster is, is uh, represented by the pipes. And these different SAMSA jobs, they do different um, operations on the, on, the, on the data that is crossed to the pipe. So you could have, as I said, um, push your logs into it. And then the first SAMSA instance does some um, yeah, strips some data out and push this data to a different topic of Kafka and then another sums of jobs consumes the data and so on. So that's basically a big Unix pipe um, yeah, that, that you can run with this. So I put Zookeeper and Kafka on, on each of the nodes to have a distributed Kafka installation and then next to it I put the sums of instances to run the job. So that's the big data part of the talk. And now um, I would like to use the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I think, to um, touch on points that I think that has still has to be explored or that will be explored over the next couple of months, hopefully. Um, first thing is, if you, when you build a Docker image, you can either run it very big or create it very big or create it very small. I used to use Fedora as my, as my foundation of all my containers, but some containers, container images are close to four gigabytes and this is not really the flexibility and agility that you want to have. So a couple of weeks ago, a month ago, I discovered Alpine Linux. Since Docker moved all their base images to Alpine as well, I thought, okay, that might be a good idea. And the Alpine Linux base image, for instance, is only five megabytes big. So if you use an Alpine Linux base image and then you put your container, uh, your, your, your desired service in it, then the container just might have only 10 or 15 megabytes, which is kind of nice if I'm at my mother's place with only two megabytes, uh, megabits per second uh, download rate. So I don't want to download the four gigabytes, right? And the question there is, should we trim down the images at all costs? So should we have the debugging tools like Vim or PS or HTOP within the container? Or should it be something that is outside of the container? Um, and when pitch sharing arrives so that you could say, um, I would like to start this container and uh, use the same pit namespace, network namespace and so on of the other container, you could have a monitoring container that just connects to all the namespaces of a certain container and then run, you can run PS and you can run Nagios, Shex or what have you within the namespaces of the other container. So there's a lot of uh, things to talk about or to think about and to experiment with. So small versus big is one of the concerns or one of the fields to explore. Another one is uh, one versus many processes. In an ideal world, everyone is stating that a container should only run one process. But for instance, if you want to run an MPI job or if you run Slurm, then you need at least a Slurm daemon and you need at least one SSH daemon within it. And maybe you want to have some monitoring as well. So you need this very tiny init system at least to start the different, different services within the container to be able to do anything with it. It would be nice if MPI run would um, start the, the processes of remote host not via SSH, but via Docker exec, or, but this uh, is something that we have, to, or we have to see. And the question here is also how fast and aggressive we want to break with a traditional approach of SSHing everywhere. So if there is a different, um, different thing to do with it, we might want to explore it. And Docker networking. Docker networking currently uses the default VXLAN, which is like 50 bytes more to each TCP package, if I got it wrong, uh, if I got it right, which uh, gives a little bit of penalty, which is not very problematic if you have a de developer's environment, but if you do HPC, then you want to get the full speed. So um, there is uh, Mac VLAN that's, that uses only layer two for uh, delay or for pushing the packets around. But what would be cooler if, if we could use uh, IP over IB or InfiniBand as a backend for this Docker networking, right? So I tried to use the IP over IB interface for the Docker networking overlay, but it turns out that the performance was not much faster than with, ET, with the Ethernet. Um, but I would love to have the IP over IB performance, obviously, right? If you have like, if you start containers which are using the ETH0 interface of the container, 
and they are backed by uh, InfiniBand, then you could have five gigabit per second or eight gigabit per second, so the speed of the IP over AB interface, which was not the case. I was a bit disappointed, but yeah, anyway. Another thing is service discovery. So if you spin up containers all over the place and you follow the microservice approach to have one container per service, then you have to glue them somehow all together. And this is yeah, something we have to uh, explore as well. So how does containers discover services in different containers? Should the registry be external? So should you just uh, look at a container and say, OK, this is a web server with this port, so I put it in the service registry to, discover, to let it be discoverable by the others? Or should the service discovery be internal to the container, so one still service that registers and deregisters services within the container? So that's something to think about. And also orchestration frameworks. In my opinion, Docker Swarm is first uh, approach for this because it's very easy, it's very understandable, so it's just a proxy in front of Docker engines. I think that's a good start. But uh, what you could easily do with Swarm as well is spin up a complete Kubernetes cluster on top of Swarm, and then you have a container, uh, Swarm, uh, a Kubernetes cluster where you can schedule containers. Um, with the help of the schedule of Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes, I think, has one cool feature, this, this notion of pods, so that you have a service pod for Elasticsearch, for instance, and then you have a service pod for something else, and you can create dependencies and relationships between the different pods, which is not that easy to express in a Docker Compose file. So there might be some, some cool features with this. Then we have immutable containers. So the immutable containers notion is that you should not look into a, or go into a container and change configuration files because uh, the, if someone looks at the container and says, okay, this container has this hash, so the image that is started has this hash, then it should not be changed, So uh, at least uh, in an ideal world. So you do not want to have an Ansible run within a container that creates stuff or installs stuff because it messes with the container's state and it should be, should be possible to kill a container, start the container again, and then yeah, it should be the same experience. And you, do not, yeah, you should not create complex mechanisms for that. And the question there arose if configuration management might be only used to bootstrap hosts and to run Docker containers on it. Because yes, configuring the containers inner workings is not, in my opinion, not longer the case for configuration management. But that's a controversial topic. So yeah, and something else I would like to explore as well is continuous development integration, this continuous X. Um, if I push stuff to GitHub and my Docker containers change, then um, there should be a way to let this change trickle down to my bare installation. So if I change my base image, then all the dependent images should be built. And at the end, there should be a job where the container is stopped, removed, the new one is started, and then I do not have to do anything but just push my changes. And there is one cool um, tool I currently use. It's GoCD, which has nothing to do with language, but um, it's like it looks like Jenkins, but nicer. And it has this nice um, management acceptable view of the old dependencies. So it's very easy to look at the dependencies and um, why a container build was, was initiated. So that's kind of a nice tool. But there are others. I mean, I, Jenkins could do the job as well, but it's not as nice, I think. And then um, this slide I, I put uh, like five minutes after the talk of Burak. Um, I think what's also very important is the reproducibility and downscaling of HPC uh, installations. So, I mean, I installed OpenFoam myself a couple of times and I failed most of the time. So, manual install on a workstation is pretty hard. And to be confident that the installation was done right is even harder. So I think it would be very nice to enable engineers uh, within small companies to use complicated solvers just by containerize the solvers, make sure that they use the right uh, SHA hash for the image, and then they can run it on their workstation. And maybe Red Hat or Ubuntu or Zuzi, they provide, or they already provide certified images with hashes. So maybe the ISVs could also say, OK, we use this certified images from Red Hat, and then we put our solver in it. And then we have a certified and, um, yeah, and supported version of our solver where everyone can work with. And since the syscalls are very stable, it should be a very good approach, in my opinion. And as I said, I have this 
uh, paper and talk about immutable containers from last year there. Okay, to recap, um, I think the vanilla tech of Docker is the best way to go currently because it's understandable, it doesn't overthrow all the existing workflows and processes, and by keeping up with the ecosystem, um, yeah, we prevent a vendor or ecosystem lock-in except the Docker lock-in, um, but I think that's a good way to do it. And also, I, I, I do not want to um, focus on the, on the caveats. I should have them on the radar, or we should have them on the radar. So how about security? I didn't talk about it. Um, how about um, big volumes? How about interconnects? How about uh, scratch file system, and so on? But I think everything is so fast moving, and who can predict what the next move of Docker is? Maybe they come around with something that is totally fit for the HPC community. It's not worthwhile to put a lot of effort in the caveats or the, the problems because they are uh, maybe solved by a, another version of Docker or any other Linux container engine. <coughs> and I don't want to scare away stakeholders, so system operations I don't want to scare away and all the developers around, uh, so I want to keep it simple and I want to reuse workflows and infrastructure. And um, that said, maybe just one remark as well. As I said, Docker was focused on the developer side, and I think that's one way, or that's my explanation why it's not foot ahead, stumped down a foot in the HPC community, because I think we are not that focused on the developer's laptop installation, right? It should be uh, a big or distributed job that we are focused on, so, or it was or is the, the focus. So I think that's maybe one reason why it hasn't pushed into HPC yet. But I think it's worth worthwhile to use it, to try it out, to have a reproducible way of, um, of doing science, which is uh, one good thing. Yeah, so that's uh, the last remark. There are a couple of events. Um, I proposed a, a workshop like last year uh, on the HPC, uh, on the ISC, High Performance Conference, so it's not committed yet, so I proposed it. I hope that it goes through. Then I'm uh, as well on the Ugano, uh, Lugano HPC Advisor Workshop, and I will iterate on this talk, so let's see what I can do in one month. And I also have a little conference in the making with the University of Pisa, where we try to provide information on how to use the stuff that I just talked about, so the little simple building, building blocks to have a simple HPC setup where everyone hopefully can can uh, work with and that we agree on the simple simple building blocks. But everyone can explore the more complex ones, but at least we should have a basic understanding about it. So, and there are links, uh, the blog and the uh, GitHub repository for the stuff I used at the HPC cluster. Okay, so I'm open for question. I think I have like five minutes, maybe two or three, or 20 seconds, so whatever applies. Please. You didn't mention storage, uh, or you did mention Docker volumes in passing. So, uh, but you also mentioned IP over ID, so I wonder if you can say RDFA, what you think about storage and integration and orchestration. So the question was, well, how about RDMA and storage in particular? Um, the same as Docker networks, networking, there is the plugin system of Docker volumes, and there is at least, I know about BGFS, which is a distributed file system, which you can directly use to connect containers to a distributed file system. So you can map, so the, or the, maybe I go one step back, so volumes, is a way or was a way in the first versions to bind mount a path on the host system to a different path or a path within the container, right? So you could say slash temp on the host should be slash data on the, on the, in the container. And with Docker 1.9, they created the plugins for Docker uh, volumes where you, you have the same bind mount option, but you have other options as well. So you could say, I have a Ceph cluster in my, in, my, in my backyard, and I can use the Ceph cluster to create volumes that I can detach to different containers. So I could have a Mongo or a, a database running with the, uh, with the Mongo, uh, with a Ceph-backed volume, and if this container goes down because the host goes down, the data is still there, and then you can attach it to a different container. And there are 
a bunch of different volumes already. I haven't tried it out. So as I said, there's a Ceph aspect volume, there is a SPGF aspect volume, and I'm pretty sure that NetApp and, and all the NAS vendors, they will come up with their own volumes, volume plugins if they don't, if they not even used it. But what you could do, even with the first versions, is you could bind mount your scratch volume file system into, the, um, into the, the container itself. So if you have the hosts that are in an HPC system already and they have slash scratch or slash parallel file system of your choice, you could use this pass on the host and then provide it to the container. That uh, is no problem. And the RDMA part, uh, I used a MPI one year ago or one and a half years ago, so since it's kernel bypassing, if you are able to uh, communicate with the device via the kernel module, so if the kernel module of InfiniBand is loaded into the kernel, then the container can use it. What, they, what is a little bit cumbersome is if you have two containers and they try to use the same InfiniBand device, then since they don't know about each other because they are separated via namespaces, then you mess up performance. So you have to make sure that it's only one container that's using the InfiniBand device. Or you use SRIOV, where you have multiple virtual devices or partitions, I think it's called. Uh, so, about virtual devices of a physical InfiniBand interface, and then you can have multiple containers. But there is another, there's another namespace proposed by Mellanox, which is an RDMA namespace, where you do not have to deal with this virtual devices anymore. They, I think, released it a couple of months ago. So, yeah, maybe eventually you don't have to care about the InfiniBand devices because it will be the only, uh, another, uh, yet another kernel namespace, but that's to be seen, I think. Yeah, long answer to a short question. Thanks. <laughs>